Today we'll be tackling the lore and, well, summary of the book Dark Imperium. This summary was done by Rizos from, I think, the Daka Daka forum or whatever I found it. Can't remember right now. So let's start with this amazing book. One hundred years has passed, technically twelve, the redone version. Mankind is now closer to the brink of extinction than it has ever been since the long night. And that's thanks to Abaddon's Warp Storm, Warp Storm, I mean, uh, the Chigatrix Maldictum, and the destruction of the alien tech that was protecting the material realm. Whereas there were once rare, breaches to the warp are now commonplace and happening all over across the galaxy. <clears throat> Our good old friend Belisarius Call has made good on his promise. He spent millennia fashioning a new legion of improved space marine, with which Gulman founded many new chapters and, well, helped supply older chapters with new recruits. This had allowed Gulman's crusade to speed from one crisis to the next and, surprisingly, even cross the great rift which divided the galaxy. After like 112 years of hard crusading, the Indominus campaign near its logical conclusion. After talking to his father in the Golden Throne and turning the Imperium over to a state of total war, with new fleets constructed and a whole population recruited, the conclusion was at hand. The Great Rift, the great rift still splits the sky, unfortunately, but the enemy has been dealt a grievous blow. Several traitor fleets shattered, demonic legions banished, and many worlds taken back. With the Imperium shored up, the time of the Great Armada was done. The Indomitus campaign concludes with a change in strategy. A final battle of the Crusade, the Pit of Rakos, will decide the form of this new approach. And we have to understand some interesting thing, the forces of Nurgle make advances on Ultramar. Draw the hospital plant of Yax throughout the description of the Pit of Rakos. And you know Yax is gonna become an important event and planet a bit later on. Let's circle back though. Elements of the World Bearers, the Black Legion, Iron Warriors, and various renegade forces oppose Guliman's armada. World, world Bearers are the greatest contingent. The enemy is constructing something in orbit, whatever it might be, and it's an orbital temple. Guess for what? For blood sacrifices, to keep the doorway that is the Pit of Rakos open. Proximity to the Pit of Rakos makes astrotelepathy difficult. Hard, some might say. Represent representatives of all arms of the Crusade are present in the battle as insisted by our good boy Gulliman himself. The Pit of Rakos is huge, slowly turning. Interference between the warp and real space within it, within the gas of the dying star, it separates anomaly from the main storm front of the Great Rift, but a deep wound in its own right. It's a deep hole in the heart of the warp. A description of the appearance of the hole can be found at page 67, yes. The Imperium currently lacks the ability to close the doorways to the warp, Ex warp, especially doorways like the Pit of Rakos. Yet they can destroy the fleets and structures that service and support them, so that's better than nothing. Orbital temples are usually constructed by the war bearers and have been, and they've managed to build quite a bunch of them in their history. The Imperial fleet gains the upper hand on the Chaos fleet because of Gulman's leadership. None will ever doubt that, because of his strategic acumen and perceptive abilities as well. The Chaos fleet and then the Orbital Temple are destroyed. The Imperial forces then prepare for a ground invasion of the nearby planet to scour the world clean. And on the ground, the assault is victorious. Gulman ends the Indomitus Crusade. During the, set, the setup for the celebration at the end of the crusade, an old style marine arrives to inform Gulman of the dead guard that is attacking Ultramar. The Endurance, surprisingly the ship of Mortarion, who needs ship as a demon primarch, whatever, leads a fleet towards Ultramar. 
Espander has been under attack by the Risen Dead for a long, grueling war. During this war, agents of Nurgle infect soldiers, who will then go on to the hospital world of Yax, and you can probably imagine what happens next. Yeah, it's a pathway to a demon invasion. Who would have known? Belisarius Kolo is searching for pylons to reactivate and to allow him to reproduce the technology. Kao has had limited success and sends machines to close the pit of Rokos. Kao works to eventually close the Great Rift with such technology. Gulma, on the other hand, hopes to use them to establish a permanent route to the Empire, to the Imperium Nihilus, excuse me. But this is decades or even centuries away at the rate that Kao is currently working at. When the crusade ended, Guleman declares that he will now take those Primaris Marines of his gene line and march for McCree. Hidden inside wounded soldiers, the invasion of Yaks begins as a rift is opened to Nurgle's garden. They're not gonna get out of that one in a good shape. Nurgle infested void wells, basically the constructed ships, squirm out to deliver an invasion on Yaks, bringing waves of demons with them. They also bring Kugat and six other greater demons of Nurgle who brought Nurgle's own pot alongside his diseases, of course. Chaos cultists lead a rebellion, ostensibly a demand for more food and freedom in Illyria. Mertarian has set up a large demonic machine in the hive city of Ardium, walking dead and dead guard garrison the hive now. The machine is a large clock which spreads demonic influence throughout the sector. It destabilizes the star realm of Ultramar and allows the leakage of the warp into our space-time. It is made with chaos and Xenos machinery, of course it needs to be burned, but we'll get to that. It was made by Mortarion himself, the heretic of course. Felix leads a strike force and destroys it. Good for him. Let's go to our favorite boy Typhus for a moment. Typhus refuses to participate in Mortarion's plans. Accusing Mortarion in, pers in pursuing vengeance over and above, seeking to expand Nurgle's garden into Ultramar. On the other hand, Kugat is creating the greatest disease ever, intended to kill Guliman himself. Mortarion plans to allow Guliman victory on Ardium as part of a, lo of a longer term plan to poison, weaken, and kill the Primarch. Guliman holds a council on Magri and it's called the Council of Hera. The Roman attributes cannot be denied. The White Scars and 24 other chapters are coming to the aid of Ultramar. During the Council of Hera, Guliman announces that the Adeptus of Sartes will rule over Greater Ultramar with the reinstatement of the old title Tetrarch. Five Space Marines will rule a planet in which, in turn, which in turn rules a sector of Greater Ultramar. Between these five sectors, all Ultramar will be ruled by Space Marines. Specifically, Agamemnon rules Connor, that's the planet, Portan rules Andermerg, Baltus rules Protos, Felix rules Vestapor, and Kalgar rules over the Central World as a chapter master. Kalgar is the overarching ruler of them, if you didn't get it. He is the chapter master of the Ultramarines. <clears throat> Human rulers of the realms of Ultramar voice their discontent at Guliman, well, his redistribution of power into the hands of the Astartes. Kind of reminds me of a time way back during the Hor Horus Heresy. <laughs> Mortarion, on the other hand, has, well, the Hand of Darkness and is using it to create artifacts which allow him to raise so many undead across Ultramar, they become unbearable. These devices have been placed around strategically to create a net which enhances war power in some form yet unknown to us. Guliman, Guliman decides to first attack Espador, with the demons on Yaks being too strong until, you know, they destroy more devices. He declares the endeavor the Spear of Espador and intends to capture the system which is closest to the Scourge Stars and cut off Mortarian supplies and reinforcements. Espadoria Terito, a city holding the last demon clock of Espador, is assaulted by five and a half thousand space marines. And, with such a big number, of course the assault is successful. 
Gulliman leads 20 librarians and some Sisters of Silence into the cathedral at the center of Espadoria, Terito, where they locate the clock. Together with Frater Matteo, they destroy the clock. When the clock is destroyed, a rift is open and the clock turns into a demon, because of course it is. It does. The demon is Quaramar, Quaramar, whatever, of the lost second, the Roth Drake. It causes demons to pour into the cathedral. Gulliman fights and sends this demon back to the warp, thanks to his beloved sword. With Espadar now saves, Gulliman leaves some chapters to secure it and purge any of the remaining death guards. The rest of his forces are to withdraw and redeploy to Parmenio, and well, Gulliman is sure that he will find Mortarion there. But that's in a different book. Let's look at the more character driven aspects of this book now. German rarely sleeps now. Sleep is described as a casualty of being dead so long. Now he meditates. I guess that works. Call mentioned as the only capable as being the only being capable of understanding how Primarchs work or how their body works. Gulliman blames himself for the failure of the Tesla campaign in which he was wounded. He views being awoken 10,000 years later into the same war as an opportunity to put things right. In his darkest moment, he reflects that the world, the world he now lives in, may be the hell of some primitive cult. Where has he been condemned to suffer? Gurman only feels capable of fully concentrating on a single issue in his reflection room. His attention is drawn to many issues simultaneously when not in reclusion. Attention to detail is exceptional. He demands and receives updates even when only retired to meditation for short periods. Goodman's quarters above the McCreek's honor, which he thought he lost, that's his ship, altogether, were preserved since its pursuit of Lorgar, and he now uses them as his, as his flagship. It is designed for the legions of old, and it is technically no longer underused and houses a large number of marines like during the Great Crusade. Yay. Gurman's hair has thinned slightly. His face is a little more worn. He now has some grey hair. He still carries pain. Since his resurrection and the lingering after effects of Fulgrim's poison, spiritual pain though. Gurman refuses to accept it as such and describes it as emotional. But it still haunts him. His soul has been injured, but he refuses to accept that. New podiums in Gulliman's armory slash museum on his flagship house examples of the new Mark X power armor, all designed for different combat roles. I mean, Mark X, Mark, Mark 10, whatever, call it whatever you want. Gulliman can take off his power armor and it's stored in the Grand Hall of Armament. His old armor is stored in the reliquary of McCree. Gulliman reintroduced the practice of being a statesman and warrior to his chapter. He even discusses matter of state and development of his dominions during the preparation for battle, when brief respite allows it. Gulliman allows the tech priest to pray during the equipping during equipping his armor, although he winches at it. He has little time for religion and then insists that the tech priest stop singing. He still finds time to rule Ultramar from afar, despite the pressure of the campaign. The followers of Nurgle have killed more with plagues than the violence of the war itself. For the first 30 years after his resurrection, Gulliman would correct his subordinates when they misquoted him. He explained that his supposed sayings were apocryphal. He then gave up in exasperation. Most did not believe his denials, holding Gulliman up as an ideal. Valuing, valuing their preconception, preconceptions of him too highly. Tribune Maldor Colquan of the Adeptus Custodes is ashamed as the, at the Custodes because of their lack of action. He responds to this shame by directing Gaul at the troubles of the Imperium. Gulliman, who has been declared the Imperial Regent and Emperor's living voice, allowing command of the Custodes, privately agrees with the sentiment. He found the custodians overcome with grief and uninterest in the happenings outside of the imperial palace. In the face of crisis after crisis, small groups of them now operate across the galaxy. They now risk being blinded by, by the rage. 
Qualcomm has refitted the McCreek's honor with new machines and a new configuration of old devices. Tech priests were outraged, but Goldman silenced them, of course, nobody would dare question him. Qualcomm has his own faction of tech priests, and they maintain it. It is at least 10% more effective than the previous technology and more reliable. Kiosk's resistance to authority and centralized leadership has allowed Gulliman to get an advantage time and time again throughout the crusade. And it's an exceptional it's an exceptional perception allow his exceptional perception blah, allows him to direct his fleet to swiftly de to swiftly destroy ships that could otherwise withstand hours of bombardment, picking out weaknesses in their shield layers which would otherwise go unnoticed. Gulliman only formed half of the original Primaris Marines into chapter, the chapters. The other half were used in large armies, with some elements of the codex, codex being followed. This resulted in then sometimes fighting like the old legions. This group was called the Unnumbered Sons of the Primarchs. But they called themselves Grey Shields, of course. And they were slowly divided into, off into depleted chapters or to form new ones. A new type of ship transporting up to 50 marines specialized in atmospheric scouting and troop insertion was developed for the crusade. <sighs> this of course was crafted by Belisarius Call, and it dwarves a Thunderhawk and is called Overlord. Yeah. Gulliman spends any leisure time available to him reading histories about the time in between his death and rebirth. Cole provided him with some updates, but this information was vague due to cause seclusion and focus on his study. Gulliman finds himself having to make up for the shortcoming of others, Cole in this case, when it comes to figuring out the history he missed. The discipline of history has become mired in superstition and pseudoscience. The Inquisition even offers some resistance to, resistance to Gulliman's search of knowledge. To counter this going forward, Gulliman is training his own historians. These new historians are called uh, Historitor Investigatus. After a hundred years, there are now 500 of them who use Gulliman's authority to open locked vaults of information in a great undertaking to compile the lost history of the Imperium. The current year is unknown for sure due to poor handling of the Imperial dating system established by the Emperor, unfortunately. Gulliman figured it to be somewhere between the 41 and 42 millennium. Gulliman is saddened by the Imperium's attitude to failures and tries to avoid the waste of life. Gulliman's interaction with the Emperor in the throne room during the Gathering Storm so troubles Gulliman. It's described as a spear of light in pain whose psychic aftershocks troubled him still. The Imperial Navy was under strength when Gulliman took over. He is now prized of the size of the Indominus Crusade and has expanded the fleet. Salvage operations are no longer able to scavenge defeated Kyos ships. Gulliman has instead ordered new ships to be built frequently. <sighs> now for the Xenos part. The Elders have told Gulliman about the scale of war against Chaos, but have been unwilling to tell him the full story. He was awed by the Great War, which makes the past 10,000 years of conflict seem like merely a summer's campaign. Gulliman now takes on his father's role despite the skill of the task being hidden by the Emperor when he reigned. Rage keeps Gulliman from despair at the task ahead of him and the Emperor's true intention. Captain Felix, a Primaris Marine, is described by having spent 10,000 years coming in and out of stasis presumably to facilitate Call's research and development. He was recruited to the Primaris Marines project just after the war against Horus. Gulliman, Gulliman appoints his militant apostolic, apostolic from lower ranks of the clergy. He appoints Father Matthew near the end of the crusade. When asked by Matthew, Gulliman admits he does not view the Emperor as a god. The library of Ptolemy of McCree was buried because Gulliman did not want people to read about the shadow of the Second Imperium. Okay, now let's go on some more. Gulliman acknowledged he was too focused on breaking up the legions and trusted the council too much. 
He has revised the Codex Astartes and is writing a new book called the Codex Imperialis. This book shall describe the principle of good governance. Goodman wonders what would have happened if the Emperor hadn't lied when he issued the Imperial the Imperialit yeah, Imperial Truth, and if the Emperor had lied about even more than the gods of the warp. He also admits that on balance the Abdeptus Ministormu has been a force for good. He tries not to direct order he tries to not directly order them to do some things because he refuses to be a tyrant. Gulmine is recombining Greater Ultra, Ultra, uh, Ultramar. I don't know what I was about to say there. However, there is resistance. Gulman regrets granting independence to the 500 worlds. He did it to avoid setting the precedent of space marines ruling larger parts of the Imperium. Given what the Imperium became anyway, he wishes he had left it intact as an example of what the Imperium could be. In his obsession to avoid the misuse of space marines, he opened up the way for the Imperium of today. Funnily enough, some of the Primaris marines remember when Gulliman walked among the Ultramarines and told story of the times of old. I mean, they were made 10,000 years ago. You are, it's bound to happen. Cole has built a communication device in McCree's honor and is forbidden to tell all except Gulliman, and he may only visit by invitation. An astropath lives within it to help facilitate communication. Some components are Xenostic. The communication device is a bizarre construction of Call called Call Inferior. Call uses it to ask Gulliman to install him as Fabricator General of Mars. Call specifically his reconstruction device to communicate his position, asserts that he has no colleagues and is the only member of the Adeptus Mechanicus not afraid of innovation and able to improve on the Emperor's own design. The communication device holds all of Call's knowledge and may contain intelligence of its own. With a century of data, the Primaris Marines have been found to work exceptionally with a 0.001 chance of Mutation, mutational deviancy per generation. All their organs are functioning well. There has been a 94% acceptance rate of the new marines and equipment among the chapters. Note at the end of Gulliman's Crusade it contains 20,000 Primaris marines and 40,000 old marines. Flawed gene lines doesn't appear to be causing problems for the Blood Angels and Space Wolves but we'll learn about that later on. Call had, has had full success with the construction of the Primaris Marines from all gene lines. Presumably traitor and lost, and wants to push them in full production. Goodman forbids this, but suspects Call will continue to do that anyway. <clears throat> Call's creation states it doesn't know where Call is and that Goodman may not be able to meet with him in person. Goodman wonders where he is and exactly what he is doing. The priest Matthew hopes to bring faith and hope to Gulliman. The Primaris Marine represent the new Space Marine paradigm, Felix summarizes. Part of this is because they have been given political experience to bear guide the Imperium statemanship. <coughs> Excuse me, statemanship will be as important as Warcraft heh, to the new Space Marines, as Gulliman told Felix. But anyway. As the unnumbered quasi-legion of the Primaris Marine is broken up, some of them feel resentment at their new assignment, but they understand and accept their role in the new times ahead. Kalgar admits that it's hard ceding full control to Gulliman and doesn't look forward to doing it again. He feels like a failure because Ultramar is mirrored in a war as the Primarch returns. A Primaris Librarian accompanies Felix and a group of Primaris during the assault to relieve the Siege of Ardium. Gulliman increasingly, increasingly looks to the Primaris Marine as first solution. He makes no attempt to hide the fact that the days of the older Space Marines were numbered. Observes Felix, of course. Primaris aggressors play the role of the first breachers. They were big armor with shoulder pounds mounted missiles, possibly also armor with flamers. I like arming them with flamers, too, honestly. Felix wishes for the flexibility older style Space Marine squads offered, especially 
jealous, jealous of their heavy weapons. He considers the Hell Blasters a good compromise, though. Primaris Reaver squads play the role of melee combatants, using heavy bolt pistols and an oversized combat knife augmented with disruption fields. They also have enlarged shoulder pads to act as a shield in melee. They are infiltration and close combat specialists. Moltarian ship, the Endurance, houses or is a small part, part of Nurgle's garden transported into the mortal world. Mortarion has captured the soul of his adopted father. I mean, here it says not the Emperor, but we all know it's Nurgle, an and it's a tiny fragment, and keeps it on his ship to torment it. He spent a thousand years chasing the soul of his Xenos father, focusing on nothing else. Typhus has a clear contentment for his gene father. He views him as not fully believing in chaos, and as not having sacrificed for his position, and see his plan and see as his plan. As f sees his plan as flawed and not blessed by Nargo, and thus Typhus refuses to participate in uh, Mortarion's plan. Kalgar accepts that Felix was added as captain without the company, yet, to the Ultramarines, because it is Guleman who appointed him. Kal ah, wait a minute. Uh, Kalgar finds something about how casually Guleman uses the ancient relics like they were everyday objects offensive of course he does however he also chastises himself for this notion and acknowledges that such relics are precious because they were in fact the primarch's everyday object furniture and other such stuff Kargar views the primarch as an overly autocratic resorting to the to tricks in his use of power for example after some reflection karga isn't sure if he's disappointed in gulman or in his fellow man during Gulman's address to the council, Kargar feels like a failure. Poor Kargar. During the council of Hera, Gulman promotes Astartes to rule over men in various parts of Ultramar. He does this because of his disappointment in how men have ruled themselves. He selects marines from all chapters that originate from his gene seed. To minimize, to minimize the chance of descent between the Primaris marines and the old marines, Felix is appointed as one of the five Tetrarch ruling over Ultramar. This causes significant discontent within the human rulers at the council. Gulliman states that he intends this to be a model for all of the Imperia. Kalgar views Gulliman's word at the council as yet another insult, although disguised in kind words. Gulliman accepts intelligence from the Inari in the form of explanation of how the dead are being risen across Ultramar. Abaddon gained the Hand of Darkness, which was constructed by the Old Ones. This was then given to Mortarion. Malkades, the first Primaris Marine to fall in Ultramar, was interred into a Redemptor Dreadnought. So now he's a Dreadnought boy, a huge one. Gulman insisted that the city of Espadoria Terito be captured by assault rather than destroyed by orbital bombardments. He states publicly that this is to avoid destroying any surviving citizens. In private, he admits it's also to ensure the destruction of the artifact within. An existing marine save Fe saves Felix on the battlefield and comments that in Felix's new office, the great days are born again. During the battle for Espadoria Terito, Felix takes command of, in of an increasing number of marines as their leadership becomes scattered and the squads are displaced during the attack. Felix still has troubles accepting the way the Emperor's worship in the New Age he awoke to. Hmm. Medical team rescues some dis disease survivors from Espadoria Teito. The team exhibits bravery and even range ahead of the advancing Imperial forces in some cases, to find citizens to help as quickly as possible. The resilience of the citizens gives Felix faith in his purpose and in humanity. Gilman occasionally wonders if the Emperor is in fact a god, but every time he considers it, he ends up dismissing the possibility. He had made a point of re-establishing the Sisters of Silence who had become less prominent over time and dwindled to near extinction. It surprises Gulliman that they too worship him as a living saint. The militant apostolic 
Matthew enters the cathedral of Espadoria Trito as Gulliman is about to attack the final clock on the planet. Despite the presence of Nurgle's plague and minions, he wears no protective suit and is unharmed. He prays at the feet of the clock. Gulliman is angry that the Emperor lied about the nature of the warp and left the Primarchs and Space Marines vulnerable to it. Matthews explains that the Emperor is indeed a god by virtue of the power he yields. He uses the Emperor's Tarot, the Living Saints and the Legion of the Damned as examples. Gulliman reflects on his meeting with the Emperor. The truth of the Emperor's feelings were exposed to Gulliman. His creations were mere tools and now loved as sons. Gulliman accepts that he could only defeat the demon uh, Quarmar because of the Emperor's blade and that this is somehow godlike. Gulliman tells Matthew that the Emperor loves them all. But Gulliman knows it to be all a big lie.